So good afternoon, everyone. This is Lois Pace from the Global Health Council. Uh, I wanted to welcome you all to our first in a series of conversations we are hoping to have uh, on uh, COVID and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We recognize that people uh, have a, a number of questions, surely, about what's going on and what it means for themselves individually, what it means for um, their organizations. And so we're hoping that this um, um, will be helpful um, to, to those of you who um, have some of those questions or concerns um, or even ideas for how each of us uh, moves through this moment. Um, with that, I wanted to take time to, uh, if I can have the next slide, please, uh, start things off uh, with just a reflection on the current moment that we're in. And uh, and just kind of take a step back and remember that we are, this is sort of unprecedented uh, for those of us um, who are living through this now in our lifetimes. And uh, there's a special piece that circulated a couple of months ago, uh, pulled together by um, a woman by the name of Lynn Unger, based in uh, California. And she says, center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has become clear. Do not reach out your hands, reach out your heart. Reach out your words, reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly, where we cannot touch. And that's an excerpt from her poem, Pandemic. And so I, I felt we would be remiss if we didn't um, have that bit of reflection um, again for how this is uh, affecting each of us, our families, um, people we know and love around the world. And I would just like to say thank you to each of you for everything you do every day um, to um, face this moment head on and, and to essentially be on the front lines um, and some of you very much so uh, every day. When it comes to um, when it comes to the current pandemic, so um, getting into the next slide, um, I also um, want to acknowledge that um, this is also having a, a real impact on each of your organizations. Um, we uh, actually sent out sort of a rapid response survey a couple of weeks ago, and we want to thank those of you who responded to that. We heard from about a quarter of our membership, uh, and so we, this is something that we actually want to repeat um, in the next few weeks, uh, just so we can get a larger catchment and also a better understanding of uh, what, what each of you truly is facing. But essentially, uh, we asked first off what the impact of all of this has been pretty immediately on your operations, and no surprise, a lot of you reported a cancellation of meetings and events immediately, and again, this was taken just sort of early um, or mid-March. Um, there was also though a very real response around how it's affected your workforce, um, both uh, in the US and abroad. And so I think that's a very important piece, especially when it comes to uh, program or service delays, um, which about half of you reported. I expect those numbers will tick up over time. Um, in terms of the um, other category, I think that was mainly um, made up of uh, folks who are already reporting some funding implications, which again is another um, data point we expect to, to increase, unfortunately, over time. Uh, in terms of how people are responding in this moment, that's something else we wanted to understand. Uh, we wanted to know um, how you all were, were mobilizing um, your resources, both human and financial. Many of you were um, very much focused on advocacy and communications, which essentially brings us to uh, the topic we're focused on today, um, but a number of organizations also uh, are very much, as I mentioned, really focused on delivery of services, um, as well as the supply chain, which again are critical uh, components to any emergency response, uh, particularly a public health emergency. And in, in the other category, there are uh, a few of our members who are uh, actually focused on research, guidance, um, standards, and other pieces. So again, thank you to each of you for that and um, keep an eye out for 
um, another survey in the future so that we can better understand what you all are experiencing. Next slide, please. So given what we have heard from uh, each of you, we did want to pull together uh, this series of conversations uh, in hopes that that would be useful to everyone. Uh, we have plans um, for what we might um, actually uh, review in a follow-up conversation, and, and it will likely be specific to some of the more programmatic implications to the degree that um, uh, has uh, or helps inform our policy discussions. Uh, and so we can talk about that a little bit more at the end of our, our dialogue today. Uh, but first off, um, uh, let me take you through a, a map of what that looks like today, uh, what we hope to cover again. And sorry, can, if, you can, if we can just stay on the last slide, uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, but um, as for today, uh, as I mentioned, you all were very keen, uh, I think, to talk more about what this moment means for each of us in terms of our advocacy, how we approach that, um, the kind of narratives that we're using um, with policymakers, uh, especially given not just our interest in global health security, but ongoing global health campaigns that each of us might be um, pursuing or leading. Um, so that's, uh, we're, we're very grateful to have a number of speakers um, with us today to talk about that. Before we get into them, though, I wanted to give you all a sense of what GHG has been up to. And as many of you know, and is, is still on the, the current slide, we have pulled together a, a page, a COVID page for you all um, so that you can understand the resources that each of you has available um, in this space, uh, as well as um, um, some of the resources that we have put together as a community, such as our global health security brief and a few other assets. And then also we have a summary of policy activities uh, related to the COVID response, both domestically and internationally. Um, so hopefully already you all feel as though you have access to uh, a good degree of information um, about each other uh, and about sort of what's happening um, around the world uh, when it comes to COVID. But if you all have other ideas for what we could include on that page that would be useful to you, please do let us know. As I said, we, we want to be responsive to what we're hearing from you. Uh, as for the next slide um, and what GHG has been doing, um, I wanted to share a few things that a number of you might be aware of already, uh, but obviously GHG has been working with global health security for quite a long time and um, with great uh, support of and credit to uh, our members and partners. And so one of the things we try and do um, obviously related to what we're doing with this webinar is coordinate the community around a collective response and that um, global health security has been um, no exception. We have a global health security roundtable co-chaired by the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Dr. Beth Cameron there, and PATH, um, uh, Brandon Ball with PATH um, are our co-chairs for that uh, global health security roundtable and have really helped lead that community uh, in how we uh, advocate both on and off the hill for these issues again over the past several years. Um, we also are grateful to have a good relationship with coalitions around Washington. Um, so we have been in touch with USGLC, Interaction, MFAN and others who I think have joined us for the call today. Um, they are, I think, ready to support um, this as an issue in solidarity with GHG uh, and global health actors. And so grateful to them um, for that commitment. And we also have been working with state-based global health alliances, those based in North Carolina, California, Washington State, Georgia, and elsewhere, um, recognizing that this is hitting home in more ways than one for them as well. Um, outside of the community and focusing on Congress, uh, we, as I mentioned, have a number of briefs that we have pulled together over time. Um, it's part of our global health briefing book. Uh, that the community has authored briefs, not just on global health security, but also on health system strengthening, frontline health workers, WASH, R&D. So again, credit to a number of organizations who have been involved in those efforts, like the Global Health Technologies Coalition, the Frontline Health Workers Coalition, Global Water 2020, um, UN Foundation, and others. Uh, and aside from those briefs, we have, uh, as I've mentioned, submitted letters um, related to recommendations for funding, including the recent supplemental as well as the forthcoming supplemental which we can discuss um, and also have worked to, uh, to 
in form of right input to legislation such as the Global Health Security Act um, that we know is pending um, in, in both houses as well. Outside of that, we um, also work in partnership with organizations like PATH and GHTC to convene a Friends of CDC um, group on a regular basis that meets with people like Dr. Rebecca Martin, who will be joining us today, um, as well as other leaders at CDC, leaders in global health, uh, and in other, uh, other departments or areas of work. We have co-hosted uh, congressional staff delegations to Atlanta so that they understand the work of that agency. Uh, and we also have been in touch with the Global Health Bureau at USAID and uh, more recently are working uh, with them to liaise with the uh, USAID COVID task force. So more on that hopefully soon. And then finally, uh, we, as many people are aware, are not just focused on work here in Washington, but also um, have a long-standing relationship with the World Health Organization. So we were on hand with a small group of you um, to actually participate in the technical briefings they were having in January, or excuse me, February on COVID um, in Geneva uh, as things were unfolding. Uh, we also are tracking um, uh, the status of the World Health Assembly, which we understand um, might still be held, although virtually. Uh, and so we'll obviously be engaged um, in that with you all through uh, vehicles like our multilateral roundtable, which is co-chaired by UN Foundation and, and GHTC. So again, stay tuned for, for updates on all of that. Hopefully that's helpful background for those of you who are less familiar with our work. Um, again, the, the work that we have been doing um, for a number of years in global health security. And, and once again, we are happy um, to have uh, maybe newcomers to the space who are trying to understand the issue and understand how they can be helpful. Uh, and obviously grateful to those of you who have been um, at the table um, for, for as long as you have, um, trying to help everyone understand um, what can and should be done in the space. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce our speakers for today. Uh, and actually I'll, I'll introduce them one by one as they offer their remarks. Uh, but first up, uh, we have um, Tracy Baird, who is the uh, president and CEO of Your Health, and I've asked her to join us today um, to talk, and each of the speakers really, to join us to talk about, again, how um, in this time of COVID, um, they are uh, approaching um, their advocacy um, tactics and messages with their community. So Tracy, first over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lois, and everyone at Global Health Council and everyone who's joined today. Um, you know, and Gender Health isn't a uh, traditional advocacy organization, but we do advocacy as part of all of our work in sexual reproductive health and rights. We join those who are leading the advocacy charge in global advocacy and then are certainly engaged, especially at the country level, in working on national level approaches and linking advocacy and services and policy and community work. Because of the nature of transmission of the new coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic has really necessarily canceled a number of the advocacy-oriented events that we have all been a part of. The data that Lois showed from the GHC member survey showed that you know 95% of us, I think it said, had events that were canceled. And so this is requiring that we do our advocacy, our sharing, our learning, our engaging through new and virtual modalities. One of the first canceled or hopefully just postponed major events um, that affected us in our sector was the Commission on the Status of Women, the CSW at the UN in New York in March. And advocates and organizations like IWHC and others worked hard and fast to secure the commitment that civil society would be at the table when the CSW was rescheduled. And several organizations were able to pivot and have their plans side events um, move into remote events. However, a key feature of CSW is the coming together of governmental and civil society, civil society delegations from all over the world. And in a year when we're meant to be recognizing the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference and committing to addressing SRHR, sexually productive health and rights, in a big way over this next decade, what was meant to be a big kickoff feels like it's hardly gotten started. Despite great materials and social media activity from UN Women and UNFPA and various NGOs and networks. 
And since CSW was canceled, many other meetings have been canceled or postponed, which reduces our engagement with colleagues and presents financial challenges for conference organizers. Truly, I imagine that we'll find we can indeed live with fewer in-person meetings, but just like working from home isn't a panacea, neither really is remote engagement for learning and advocacy. At some point, we need to be able to get back to the person-to-person connections, the sparks we find in random introductions, the serendipitous opportunities that happen for collaboration when we are gathering together. Um, An example of some advocacy that can happen beautifully online, but where we still miss out on the real person-to-person level um, is also relates to the uh, global gag rule. And there have been great campaigns recently, this month especially, um, on end the uh, end the gag, the end global gag um, campaign on social media. And addressing the global gag rule now, after the release of the GAO report earlier this month, is critical. The report demonstrated what we've known, um, which is that a vast amount of aid money went unobligated because organizations refused to abide by the gag rule. So we know that programs on family planning, HIV, even tuberculosis, went unfunded and unimplemented. And organizations and partners like Change and PAI and IWHC and others have done a great job documenting the huge significant human toll of the global gag rule, the deaths, the unintended pregnancies, the untreated disease. Um, Monica Kerrigan from Planned Parenthood Global published a great piece in Ms. Magazine this week about the impact of the global gag rule. And I'm sure you've seen, as I mentioned a moment ago, the social media activity around and global gag and fight for her. And what are the things I really noticed and really struck me in seeing those social media campaigns is a number of people posted photos of marches and rallies past. The marches and rallies that we can't have right now because we're in the COVID era. And that local rallying and marching that helps raise awareness and energize our allies really aren't, they're not possible right now. Um, and we also, we know that that is limiting some engagement from people, limiting some awareness, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that people understand the impact and implications of things like the expanded global gag rule under the Trump administration. And we know that our advocacy is especially important now because the gag rule disproportionately affects those who are most vulnerable, just like the lack of sexual and reproductive health services um, we're already seeing because of COVID-19. Um, on the local level, and gender health starting to see multiple challenges in providing sexually productive health services, especially in a time when we know the need for services increases. We know there are uh, likely more unintended pregnancies. We've got a lot of people home from school and work. Um, we know that there's increased risk of violence for people who are not safe at home. Um, we know that there's people not being able to access routine care and cancer screenings, other things that, that people need. Um, in some of the countries where we work, lack of gloves is already making some providers unable to provide certain contraceptive methods. Stockouts of contraceptives are a major problem. DKT has been informing the community about this, um, and it's a huge setback. We've heard from countries that you know they're, they're seeing the supply shortage now and don't know how the pipeline's gonna be refilled. And even the fact that contraceptive counseling and service rooms are looking like good places to isolate and care for possible COVID-19 patients means that care and even counseling and information sharing is at risk. So we're working with ministries of health and our sexual reproductive health and rights rights partners to clarify at the country level that SRHR and maternity care are essential health care and that they need to be accommodated even in this COVID-19 timeline. And the advocacy that we, that requires is the ability to work across organizations and support governments and local partners in ways big and small. One small thing that we did, I think last week, was sponsor Zoom accounts for the reproductive health teams at the ministries we partner with so they can organize and host their own meetings. And we hope that this small thing will help facilitate them to accommodate some big things. But I just want to wrap up by noting that this issue of advocacy when we are apart and not able to gather um, is going to be even more critical because the issues that we need to do advocacy about are not 
uh, slowing down. They're not going to stop emerging during this pandemic. And in fact, honestly, if anything, it feels like they're accelerating. Um, and new news, at least it was new to me today, Alma Gordon, Golden, who's the Assistant Administrator for Global Health at USAID, has been nominated for a newly formed WHO Strategic and Technical Advisory Group of Experts for Maternal, Neonatal, ch Child, Adolescent Health and Nutrition. Um, there's a public comment period, and this is an important opportunity for those who are familiar with Alma Golden's perspectives on SRHR to share feedback. Um, I hope GHC can help you the details around, but again, this is an opportunity for advocacy that we can all do from our work at home spaces and where we can coordinate and share with each other information on how we can have an impact even during this COVID time. Um, personally, I tend toward optimism. There's always something in the glass. However, it helps me to recognize that these are tough times, that we need to continue our sexual and reproductive health and rights and global health advocacy in safe, physically distant ways. And really what's critical is that we work hard together to ensure we lose as little ground as possible on other global health topics while we all actively support the international COVID-19 response. So I'll leave it there. Again, thanks to GHC and Lois for organizing this. And I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you, Tracy. Appreciate that. And again, we'll be hearing from each of the panelists first um, and then taking questions or having an open discussion, but feel free to submit your questions or comments in the meantime. Jamie, I believe you are next in our slide deck, and I would love um, for you to give us your perspective on um, your work uh, in the age of COVID. And again, for people who don't know, Jamie Benishi is the Executive Director of the Global Health Technologies Coalition. Uh, also based here in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Lois. And I think getting ready for this call, you asked me to not just share an R&D-related update, but also um, put on my hat for two seconds as the co-chair of the Global Health Council's Multilateral Roundtable. So I'll say a couple things at the end just about multilateral engagement more broadly. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, thanks. Um, as everyone knows, I think as we've been living with here in the U.S. and in other geographies, um, as COVID has just gone up and up and up. And as we discuss flattening the curve, the question is, where are we at with those diagnostics? Where are we at with those vaccines? What about other therapeutics? What are the interventions that are needed? Why don't we have enough PPE suits? Why can't we get hand sanitizer? Um, and so, you know, we within the Global Health Technologies Coalition are focused on drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics and other medical technologies. Um, with a particular focus on the low income, low resource communities and the global health communities that we serve. Um, it's obviously hard not to, to also think about that as we live, live with COVID here in the United States and again in high income countries as well. Um, maybe just to, to say, I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of updates pretty quickly. And then if there's any follow on questions, we can take that in the chat later on. Um, I did want to flag, and you'll see this on the Global Health Council's COVID page that GHTC has put together uh, a bit of a tracker on how U.S. government is supporting advancement of products um, to respond to COVID. Um, many folks may have seen that with the original supplemental package that came out several weeks back now um, from the U.S. government, there was $3.6 billion um, unlocked for R&D activities. So a lot of that money is going to the health and human services agencies, to NIH, to BARDA, to CDC, to FDA, um, and we're, we're actively tracking their progress. I think it's important to note that that's fantastic that we're seeing the science really get um, ramped up and mobilized. We also need to constantly be thinking about then how uh, the benefit of that science and research can be pivoted to support the global communities outside of the U.S. So that's something that's constantly kind of weighing in the back of our minds as, as GHTC. Um, the other thing I wanted to note for this call, because it just uh, was released last night, that the USAID COVID uh, task force and folks working within the Center for Innovation and Impact at USAID just put out an RFA last night to uh, gather information on innovations to respond to COVID-19 for low and middle income countries. So I'll make sure after my remarks to just share that link in the, in the chat box so everyone has, has access to that. Um, I'll also say that as we've seen in the past, how does USAID respond? Obviously they're thinking of the global health communities and more broadly than the United States with the effort. Um, there are discussions a bit nascent, but there are conversations evolving about the possibility of having some sort of an uh, a COVID 
Grand Challenge uh, or Innovation Exchange, similar to what we've seen previously with USAID standing up an Ebola or a Zika Grand Challenge. So again, early stages uh, at this point, I don't think there's anything published out there yet, but a lot of thinking starting to go into that and thinking about, again, what are the needs specifically for LMICs? Um, you know, I think the other piece of this is recognizing we're not working from zero in terms of R&D response to COVID. And again, our, our website has the, the full list of a lot of the R&D efforts that are happening in the stage of the research or the stage of the clinical trials. It's really important to recognize how all sorts of stakeholders in different disease areas and global health are pivoting to respond to COVID. Um, obviously, there's, uh, you know, we keep hearing in the news about Gilead and remdesivir and how do you take technologies that were promising um, for looking at Ebola, Marburg, and SARS and track sort of pivoting that to look at, at COVID-19. We've seen some interesting news come out from the TB community about the BCG vaccine, how it increases immunity for TB patients, perhaps, perhaps, uh, that that could also help to uh, increase immunity for those uh, infected with COVID-19. There's been a lot of news around, uh, obviously, the anti-malarial drugs and even the antiretroviral uh, therapies from the malaria and HIV communities and how those might might be leveraged to support the COVID effort. So, you know, I think it's really important to note how many different scientists and researchers from many, many different parts of health are really, really pivoting everything to respond. Um, also, you know, I think from our perspective, again, drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics, I, there are many diagnostics being advanced right now. We're thinking about that, not just from the perspective of things like the expert machine, where there's expert machines all over the world that now have a COVID emergency use authorization for a rapid diagnostic, but what R&D efforts are underway to support rapid diagnostic tests or point of care rapid diagnostic tests where you don't have to be in a, in a full lab facility. Again, thinking about the environments and the communities we serve. Um, so there's a whole lot there. GHTC is specifically tracking the U.S. government efforts within that. Um, if we, there, there's just so much information out there. Obviously, private sector, product development partners, and other stakeholders are, are doing even more than what we've been able to aggregate in one place. Um, but we are trying to track sort of as much of it as we can, and, and particularly how the U.S. government is supporting um, supporting that effort. I think, as Lois mentioned at the beginning of this call, um, you know, we also anticipate that there will be another. U.S. supplemental and unlocking of funds coming out, and I think this is going to be a really important time for us as the global health community to come together and reassess um, what's needed, um, what's needed of each of the U.S. agencies who engage in global health. Um, for us, we think about that in terms of, again, CDC, NIH, USAID, BARDA, DOD, FDA, a lot have a role to play. Um, but then how do we make sure that that's all married up with the, the global health community's asks? Um, I've heard several folks who don't work in emerging infectious diseases say, okay, you know, what do we need to be doing again in terms of pivoting all of our global health work beyond R&D? And I think we can all agree that the sooner we can advance medical interventions, the sooner we can minimize everyone's supply chain disruptions and other health program dis disruptions and try to mitigate sort of the losses we, we, I think all of us are worried about seeing in different health areas as a result of COVID. Um, so, just switching gears briefly as well to the multilateral side of things, um, GHTC does have on our landing page, we're tracking R&D response efforts being led by the World Health Organization and CEPI. So just to note that that's on the same, same page on our website. Um, beyond R&D, I just wanted to put that multilateral working group hat on for just a second. We're closely monitoring uh, where all conversations are moving virtually, um, the G20 proceedings. So the G20 process is proceeding on schedule just virtually. Um, the health working group has been very active the last couple of weeks, um, focusing on value-based healthcare and trying to understand the linkages of that to UHC. Um, but also, of course, very much focused on health preparedness, AMR, and innovative financing for health. And of course, that innovative financing, you're hearing a lot of news and a lot of models and a lot of proposals being discussed sort of across, across the board in terms of pandemic response uh, financing. G7 uh, is interesting. If you'd asked us a couple of months ago, it looked like the G7 countries weren't terribly focused on health as a priority area. But obviously, with COVID-19, 
um, that has changed. So we as a community, I think, are also rather rapidly pivoting, working with groups like Interaction uh, and others to, to try and refine our asks about sort of the world that we live in now with COVID-19 and what do G7 countries need to consider. Um, I don't think because of some of the, the challenges in terms of politics between the G7 countries um, that we'll see sort of a formal communique coming out of that process, but any sort of collection, collective action or commitments we can get from G7 countries to support the COVID effort, obviously we're exploring that. Um, and then the World Bank spring meetings are continuing to be held just virtually. Um, so we're gonna be looking at what is happening in terms of unlocking or repurposing different international development assistance money and how that may support low and middle income countries in the response to COVID-19, as well as watching this uh, sort of relatively newer model of pandemic bonds and how those get unlocked um, and what what how those monies might be able to, to support uh, countries who need additional assistance. Um, and then of course, last but not least, looking at WHO, um, we, you know, I think can all imagine at this point that it's very unlikely that the World Health Assembly will happen uh, in person. It's pretty much off the table, but I think it's a bit unclear at this point whether they will be holding a virtual meeting, uh, if that meeting will be postponed or canceled. And I think we're hoping to hear more on that this week. Um, I, the real question is, can any business as usual get done at WHO or, you know, do we all need to keep our headspace focused on COVID response even as we look to May? Um, so that's just a very, very quick rapid fire update on the multilateral side of things. Um, you know, I think as just a couple of final thoughts as I wrap up here for the global health community, I just would like everyone to think about how R&D efforts specifically do require a lot of money. Um, we're looking at CEPI putting out $2 billion uh, of an ask in terms of advancing vaccines. The Therapeutics Accelerated Initiative that was launched by Gates Foundation a few weeks ago um, was a great initiative focusing on the drug side of the community, but they're also saying they probably need about $3 billion of additional resources unlocked. Um, and then as we start to explore with USAID and other bilateral partners and uh, philanthropic organizations, the idea of some sort of a grand challenge that could support um, LMICs in terms of other product development, we, we're still trying to figure out what that ask might look like. Um, so just, just some things to think about. Also realizing that if we get products developed to serve the United States population, you know, there may be a priority of, of distributing that, of course, to the, the communities we've served that, that are here in the United States. We've seen that already with PPE suits. USAID going on record last week saying PPE suits are not being shipped out of the United States currently because we know that they're needed here in the US. So how do, does USAID and other partners think about scaling up of manufacturing at a local level, but then making sure that there's quality assurance in that product development? Um, and then with all of those COVID updates being shared, you know, not forgetting all non-COVID related health activities that everyone's thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we as a community need to be tracking the cost of pivoting um, so that we can try to recapture some of what is lost um, once we get COVID under control. So again, I'll stop there. Um, I promise to, to put in the chat the, uh, the RFA coming out from USAID just as one example of, of what we should be thinking about and looking at. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jamie. And before you, you go away entirely, um, one quick question as a question of whether or not if the World Bank meetings are proceeding virtually, if there's still civil society access to those, and if you can include that in the chat box as well. I don't offhand have an answer to that, but I will try mm -hmm. and get you one later this week. Great. Thank you. Okay. We'll come back to the other questions later, but we do appreciate those coming in for Jamie. Uh, we'll give her time to take a look at those and see if she can respond. Um, for now, we will move on to our next speaker in the slide deck. And I believe that's Shannon Kelman at Friends of the Global Fight. She serves as their policy director uh, and uh, head of government relations. And so Shannon, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Lois, um, and all for, for having me here. So Friends of the Global Fight uh, Against HTB and Malaria advocates on behalf of the Global Fund and the US bilaterals to end the three epidemics. As I'm sure everyone on the call knows, those who are at risk or vulnerable um, to the epidemics are also at increased vulnerability um, to exposure from COVID. So under normal circumstances, our advocacy for the first half of, of the year, like most people would be, like most organizations, I'm sure, would be focused on the appropriation cycle and ensuring funding for the Global Fund and for the US bilaterals. 
Obviously, that's not happening per usual right now. So in a perfect world, we'd be meeting with key targets on authorizing and appropriations committees, uh, conducting advocacy days, focusing on the faith community or the business community or bringing in civil society leaders from around the world to advocate um, to members of Congress and to a certain amount, the administration working on sign on letters, um, which are largely still occurring and then facilitating visits and information sharing from the Global Fund Secretariat or those in the field to members of Congress um, and, and the administration. As of right now, we know that um, half a million people have died of one of the three epidemics since the first case of coronavirus was detected in China. And, and, and making sure that policymakers know the risk that those who are living with the diseases really face um, and those who are most vulnerable is a key part of our advocacy. So the way we have largely pivoted has been to ensure that policymakers are aware of what the intersection between those epidemics, the, that is AIDS, TB, and malaria, and the COVID pandemic, how they interact and how they can how efforts to fight one can help with the other. So for three big things that we are doing on a virtual or, or teleconference way, we are ensuring that Peter Sands, the executive director of the Global Fund, has direct access to as many members of Congress and their staff as wanted. We've been conducting a series of calls um, that Peter Sands has been doing with key senior staff to ensure that they know what the Global Fund is doing on, on COVID, but also on issues related to AIDS, TB, and malaria to ensure that the direct populations are, are protected in this time. We, it's been a very interesting experience. A lot of the staffers we have talked to have made a comment along the lines that, that Peter Sands is the first person from a big global health organization that they have talked to um, in this in this situation and that he's able to provide a lot of information about how the global health community is reacting to this. We're also exploring uh, conducting virtual advocacy like webinars that will directly highlight the intersection of COVID and AIDS, TB, and malaria and how health security for one disease really has an impact on others. We'll also be moving forward hopefully in May um, with virtual advocacy days, the uh, pulling together phone or video direct advocacy to members of Congress and their staff. Um, we'll be starting with probably six to seven states, um, seeing if we need to expand outward beyond that and targeting key members that we would normally be targeting with an in-person advocacy day or fly-in, but that may not make the most sense for right now. Um, the Global Fund itself is focusing very carefully on this, not wanting to, to change their brief, as, as Peter Sands put it yesterday, but also very cognizant of the effect that this will have in, in those countries where, they, where the Global Fund works. So as of right now, 30 countries and two regional grants have taken advantage of some flexibilities that the Global Fund has put forward to to repurpose existing money or to take advantage of cost savings across grants that will allow those countries to pivot slightly towards more COVID response. Um, we, we ex that money has largely, uh, I think we're right around $500 million of that being available so far. And we expect through other uh, shifts in funding for another $500 million to be available through global fund funding for those countries that need to or want to take advantage of that and the global fund is really trying to to ensure that they are able to respond quickly to the needs of those countries that are trying to respond in in large part helping to develop preparedness and response plans to ensure a limit in duplication of efforts between the global fund the world bank the u.s bilaterals and and all of the organizations involved in response there's significant concern with Global Fund implementing countries that many of these health systems need to be shored up, particularly in the in low income countries, because COVID puts the entire health system at a risk of collapse, uh, a fact that would have massive impact, not just on the broader population at risk of COVID, but uh, for the populations who are largely at risk of AIDS, TB and malaria. One of the biggest lessons that we've seen 
from the epidemics that we're hoping to find a way to translate to to COVID response as well is that engaging communities has to be key for us um, and for the global fund that that social distancing can't really be enforced that the community at large particularly in high density um high poverty communities has to be they have to be personally involved and it has to come from a community level that this can't be enforced from the outside or from the national governments so i will stop there i'm happy to speak a little bit more on what the global fund is doing and how we're approaching our advocacy on their behalf Thanks a lot, Shannon. Um, we have at least one question, I think, that was sparked by your update on the Global Fund and its efforts, um, just with regards to um, donor coordination in general, particular coordination sure. across the, the major donors, but we'll, we'll pause. Um, I'll let you sort of noodle on that, and we'll turn to Marion um, for her remarks. Great, thank you. Um, uh, can you hear me? Wentworth, if we can advance the slide, thanks. <laughs> um, there we go. There's a president and CEO of Management Sciences for Health. Um, she has been at the helm there for the past few years um, and um, has a lot of knowledge around health systems um, and the work that they're doing across the board um, in healthcare and services around the world. So, Marion, thanks very much for joining us today. Great. Thank you very much, Lois. Um, I'm coming up at, uh, I'm just starting my fourth year at the helm of, of Management Sciences for Health. Um, the past couple of weeks, I think I'm getting more and more questions, however, related to my past life in vaccines and vaccines development. Um, and so I'm really thrilled to actually talk a little bit about what international NGOs like Management Sciences for Health are, are doing. Um, those of us at Management Sciences for Health um, and organizations that are similar that have programs in low and low middle income countries um, right now are being asked to support the, the local response to COVID-19. And, and those um, requests are coming from both donors, USAID, Global Fund, uh, a little bit, and from national governments, ministers of health and others um, with whom we've partnered over many, many years. And the requests come with or without additional funding, of course. And I wanted to double click into some specific kinds of things so you have a sense for what's what's happening right now. I think the situation's quite fluid um, and that it will change over time. Um, but uh, as an example, we have a large global medicines, technologies and pharmaceutical systems strengthening program that's funded by USAID and implemented by a consortium of partners with MSH at the lead. And we've received additional funding to accelerate those program goals that are around pharmaceutical system strengthening in um, seven countries. And we think it's going to grow to 10 in the next couple of weeks. And to give you an idea about what that work includes, it includes things like strengthening um, infection prevention and control um, measures, helping people develop what are called IPC guidelines, infection prevention and control, uh, for staff, um, for patients, for families, caregivers, and other institutions. Um, it involves training um, trainers to identify sort of COVID-19 champions to increase awareness of infection prevention best practices. Um, it involves supporting national and country level COVID-19 task 40s task forces and IPC committees to develop rapid response action plans to manage the outbreak. Um, and in one case, actually, we're supporting um, supply chain efforts to increase availability of personal protective equipment and other key commodities. And that work, by the way, we think will increase. Outside of the pharmaceutical systems work that we're doing, we are involved in health system strengthening of other sorts in a number of different countries. And I wanted to give you a flavor for some of what we're doing there. Um, in Bangladesh, we're developing public information campaigns and guidelines for the workforce and coordinating um, the preparedness logistics. In Madagascar, we've been supporting the Minister of Health's preparedness efforts, including helping him create health communications and awareness campaign and the development of a COVID-19 response plan for that country. We're also working to integrate the reporting of COVID-19 cases into the existing um, information system, DHIS2 system, um, so that we can help with data reporting. 
In Malawi, we're using our existing programs to assist social mobilization and risk communication campaigns through community engagement. We're involved in a number of states in Malawi, and so that's really important. And working with donors, we're also providing limited assistance to cross-border surveillance on the Tanzania border with customs officers and helping with the renovation of an isolation ward. Um, in Nigeria, and Shannon already referred to this, um, uh, the Global Fund has in many places allowed a certain amount of funding to be reprogrammed to COVID-19 response. We have a big program in Nigeria, um, and so we're um, working with the ministry there to develop what that is. So just a few points in terms of what's on the what's going on in the ground. In general, with respect to our advocacy efforts, of course, there's a lot we're not doing. Um, there's a lot we're not doing at the World Health Assembly. Um, there are lots of things that we're not doing um, with uh, other uh, convenings on a global basis. But we do um, continue to engage lawmakers on Capitol Hill, including um, doing advocacy work to increase funding um, for COVID-19 in each of the emergency supplementals for both domestic and importantly global response. Um, we're maintaining relationships with key advocates as we go through appropriation season to ensure that other health issues are not forgotten, um, HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, maternal child health, et cetera, and make sure that they continue to be adequately funding. We're also working with a variety of media outlets to make sure that we're raising a lot awareness of the need for key investments in health system strengthening. These are the kinds of things that, you know, in a time like this, sometimes we retrench, but we've got to remember this particular disease didn't start here. It starts in the weakest systems um, uh, around, or it starts in random places and then gets to and is incubated in weak systems. So we really need to continue to make sure that we understand that all of our health systems are connected. And then when it comes to our advocacy opportunities outside of the United States, um, we are being asked, as I said, by country governments for help. Um, we really need to advocate for a strong system strengthening approach and an interconnectedness of systems from place to place kind of approach. Obviously, an infectious disease threat anywhere is a threat to all of us everywhere. So that's a little bit of what we're doing right at the moment. I think as uh, new treatment modalities and vaccines and so forth start to emerge as truly promising and truly useful, we'll discover that there's a lot more that we need to do with respect to um, advocacy for and implementation. There, and I'm afraid we might have lost you. someone on the line did i talk to myself i yeah there you are i think we we lost you for a bit but go ahead marion um i'm sorry i just went through just a whole the last, spiel. just the last sentence or two Thanks. oh i see okay um i think as as we get more treatments and more prevention available um, that uh, we are going to have to be uh, really supportive in, in helping countries understand how to develop the advocacy and policy tools and the communication tools and the programmatic design to make them get uh, to the right place at the right time in a timely fashion. And MSH is ready, willing, and able to both lead and support. Thank you, Marion. Sorry about the technical difficulty in the end, but rest assured we heard most of what you had to share. Okay. <laughs> so I think at this time we would like to turn to some of the questions we've received, and I think the um, panelists have um, been responding to those accordingly. Um, I know some of you have asked specifically about um, testing uh, and testing in the US. And I think the recommendation is that we wait to hear from our speaker from CDC um, for that update to the degree they're prepared to respond. 
Um, there's another question about um, tests available, um, inexpensive tests available, and um, just for everyone's benefit, for those of you who don't see it in the chat box, um, there's um, information about the, the mapping that FIND is doing uh, on that. Uh, and so if anyone um, has more questions that they want to ask, please do use the chat box as it's displaying online. I know some people are having a bit of trouble viewing the slides, but um, there is a function or a drop down uh, in GoToWebinar that says chat, and you'll be able to click on that triangle or button so that you can pose a question um, for the panelists. Um, and then the responses should be appearing um, there as well. Um, coming back to the question we had um, uh, that I thought that Shannon could kick off um, around coordination across donor agencies. Shannon, to what degree are you um, hearing from uh, Global Fund that they're in contact with other multilateral donor institutions on how they collectively are responding in this moment? I think it's quite impressive to have seen or heard from Peter, um, his leadership in this regard and the, the unlocking or flexibility of funding. Um, but what are the signals that, um, if any, that you all are gathering from Gavi? I think we've seen some of that um, or other um, institutions uh, are in discussions. Can you respond? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so donor coordination across markets and uh, across um, uh, implementation is one of the the key skills and flexibilities that the global fund brings to global health writ large um, and so it's been something that I know Peter and, and others at the Secretariat are very focused on in this general time of uncertainty. Um, we expect in the next few days for there to be a, a board decision point um, on um, on some other possible flexibilities that the, the Global Fund will be trying to offer implementing countries and, and grant recipients um, in terms of how to, to make use of Global Fund monies to best respond to, to key needs um, as well as COVID. Um, I know that the Global Fund is in close collaboration as always um, with the US bilateral programs to ensure um, a limit of duplication efforts and to ensure that that money is targeted in a, a in an effective way. Um, Gerard's conversation I, or question um, made me smile. The onslaught of future funding for COVID-19 um, assumes an onslaught on a, a global level, um, which I think in certain respects we all probably wish to see. I am not sure that it will necessarily be um in this direct sort of collaboration effort that the global fund usually usually works but i do think that donor collaboration will be key or donor collaboration will be key um to ensure that plans like a covid preparedness and response plan take into account where various money is coming from Thanks, Shannon. And then can you speak as well to another question we received on um, the impact of COVID on services for AIDS, TB, and malaria, and specifically how soon you think we'll actually see data on that, if not sure. already? Um, so to be honest, I don't know when we're going to see data. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know that anyone knows when we are going to see data on this. Um, I think everyone's assuming a certain amount of impact, though we're obviously all working to mitigate that as much as humanly possible. The Global Fund especially in working with, with grant recipients on that. As a general rule, it often takes a year, if not more, for us to see results from programming in the best of circumstances. Um, I think seeing how the shift in services away from AIDS, TB, and malaria to the shift of coronavirus, we may not know for quite some time. I think we are operating under the assumption that a shift away from the three epidemics is, while in some places going to be necessary, going to be highly detrimental for those most at risk, and how can we mitigate those risks for the vast majority of people. Thanks very much for that. Um, Marion, I believe we had a question for you as well. Um, 
specific to your thoughts on preparedness and next steps in sub-Saharan Africa, um, where there's arguably lower access to healthcare workers, testing and meds. Um, so um, I didn't know if you um, wanted to expand on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I made a ref Thank you. Uh, the question of what you can do when you don't have an inadequate, when you have an inadequate number of healthcare workers is actually a question we're facing in the United States and places like New York City too. Um, you have to improvise. The the only good news in this is that um, improvisation has been going on for a long time. It's been hugely important for us not only to train around particular measures like social distancing and infection prevention and control, but to train the trainers around those and to make sure that they have materials so that they can recruit and, and second other uh, individuals uh, to supporting them. And I think the requests that ministries have made in terms of media communications, um, around community action is hugely, hugely important. Um, and I wouldn't underestimate the challenge even for, in terms of community response with something like socially, social distancing. More and more of our most low resource individuals are in very high density geographies. Um, I mean, really high density geographies. I was in the slums of Mumbai, India in January and you know you have as many as 10 people who call the same square meter their home um, it's very difficult for them to socially distance so um, i think getting the word out to communities so that they can do their best with the resources they have available to them we have more tools than ever including social media um, lots and lots of access to uh, cell phones some smart or otherwise um, we've even in past outbreaks used things like WhatsApp chats and things like that to up our surveillance efforts um, for other kinds of outbreaks. I think we just have to use every tool that's available and a lot of it is actually yeah. amplifying work we're already doing, um, but making sure that it's directed right now specifically to COVID-19. Thanks very much for that, Marion. And I'm glad you mentioned um, sort of the, the other ways you're trying to get the word out or otherwise mobilize communities. There was a question specific to WhatsApp groups and um, Facebook Messenger and other, um, other platforms people are using to um, understand the impact in communities um, or otherwise um, kind of get to what I think um, Shannon was mentioning to bring people together to engage communities. Um, and I was wondering if Tracy could speak to, to that and whether or not um, you all are finding um, new ways to gather information on the ground and perhaps others can, can feel free to chime in as well. But Tracy, any insights there? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think WhatsApp is an enormously important tool right now. Um, I think we've all been using it and now we'll learn very quickly how to maximize it. We've also um, been working with local sort of champions and, and communicators in their communities. For example, we've been uh, working with a group of young bloggers in Cote d'Ivoire already to help them understand SRHR issues um, and be a force for positive change in their communities and now ensuring that they have information they need in this environment to continue to get the word out to audiences they already have. So finding the people who, who have audiences and making sure that they are informed and supported and connected, whether they are blogging or they're posting or they have their own community groups. Um, I think also we have the you know, mechanisms of working through our community health structures, which while they're, you know, people are, are sheltering in place and staying home, um, it's, it, it appears that some community health services at least are are continuing and of course we know they need to so ensuring that people in the community health system and the community health workers have the information they need both to stay confident and protected in the work that they're doing but also to be able to be reliable resources for information for those they're seeing they may be out um, you know providing still immunizations but making sure that they have information they need to share with people um, and making sure that they are prepared to catch up on all the critical services that can't happen right now. Um, and I think paying attention country by country and community by community to what's still possible and for us to be able to track what services, care, and information will need to be caught up um, once people can be more together again. 
um, is going to be important. So some of it's about communicating now, and some of it is recognizing the gaps now so we can fast track the catching up of those communications later. Thanks, Tracy. Appreciate that. Um, just a couple more questions we want to run through um, before we turn it over to our guests from um, CDC. Um, but, uh, oh, look, people are just trying to come in at the wire. I appreciate that. Okay, so um, there's one question about whether or not WHO is planning on endorsing any one or a few of the diagnostic tests. I don't know if, Jamie, you happen to have an answer to that, um, considering you've been tracking that somewhat. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think all of the WHO technology assessment teams are sort of in full gear and sort of like our FDA here in the United States are looking at sort of emergency use authorizations and making sure that there's decent efficacy on any diagnostic tools rolled out. So, um, you know, I think the folks who work, I mean, I've just heard off the record that that folks who are working on things like the SAGE group of experts who worked on the essential diagnostics list are definitely engaged in thinking about this. The exact processes that they're going through to sort of do that evaluation I don't think is, is public information. Um, but mm -hmm. we do know that WHO is very actively looking on this. You know, also on the multilateral side of things, I didn't mention, but I heard on a call earlier today that um, there had been the ask, and, and uh, GHC has this on their website as well, about a solidarity fund in support of WHO. Mm -hmm. That fund and the original asks for that were to get WHO through sort of emergency response efforts through April. Uh, right. We understand that those numbers are being reassessed and that there may be a new increased ask um, looking at what's needed uh, for for WHO and for the COVID response effort more broadly through the end of the year or into early next year. Um, and uh, and then, you know, embedded in that include, and, and we've heard the number thrown out of tens of billions today on a call, mm -hmm. um, but that that would also include things that WHO wouldn't directly be managing like a SEPI response or other R&D activities. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, I think that the big challenge for us right now is the global health community is there's a lot of we always have the silos. We have to break down our silos more than ever right now and then make sure that we're, we're linking up as many of these efforts and response activities as possible and, and trying to get, get more organized and more streamlined than we ever have before. Mm -hmm. Great. And just so you know, Carolyn Reynolds was able to chime in with a, a response to the other question you'd received about um, access to World Bank and IMF meetings. So it sounds like um, only the official meetings are happening as virtual meetings. Um, and um, and not necessarily open uh, to um, others as they are or would have been if had they been face to face. Um, the one exception it sounds like the global financing facility um, IG is is meeting virtually, um, and there might be some civil society access there. So thanks to Carolyn for that update, um, and it's something for us to keep in mind as we look towards other um, meetings that normally do have civil society engagement. Um, we want to be sure that um, that is maintained. Um, even as they sort of move online. Um, a couple of other uh, quick questions, hopefully. Um, I know that uh, MSH has been involved previously with the um, Global Health uh, Security Agenda Consortium, and there was a question that came in about whether or not zoonotic issues are being addressed um, by congressional action or appropriation. I didn't know if, Jamie, you happen to be tracking that as well um, in your role with GHTC, um, but um, I wanted to... Um, present that question from Richard, who asked. Ashley, you on? Yes, I'm on. And if everybody can hear me, I'm, I'm happy to, to take a, a, a quick stab at that. Um, so we have seen that some of the, some of the longstanding USAID programs have not been um, up for rebidding um, based on kind of identifying zoonotic origins of disease, um, the big flagship programs like PREDICT. Um, now there are upcoming bids coming out in the spring um, that do address zoonotic um, sources. Are we, seeing, like, are we seeing huge pots of funding for zoonotic disease, infectious disease surveillance in congressional appropriations? Um, not as of yet, um, but we are um, at Management Sciences for Health working to incorporate zoonotic um, and animal health workers at the community level in electronic surveillance, community-based surveillance programs um, that's been integrated into existing data systems. 
So we, we're seeing it limited. Are we seeing huge pots of funding? Not as of yet. And that's, that's a gap that, that probably should be addressed by the advocacy community moving forward. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Ashley, for stepping in. And on that note, I think we got a really good question about what the advocacy community should be saying and doing now, frankly. Um, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to have this call. I think we recognize, we often recognize at GHG the opportunity to um, uh, truly um, come together. And uh, we think that this is certainly one of those moments. We recognize that generally people have a number of different issues or priorities that they're tracking. And yet, um, this is, uh, again, a, a really important time uh, during which uh, the spotlight is on global health. And so there's a chance for us to truly put forth um, one or two or three key asks across the community and in, on a united front. And so I want to thank Henry for presenting us with that question. This is something that we pose through our symposiums at Global Health Council over the years as well. And as some of you know, we've been working towards this big idea for global health. So in other words, what are um, what the U.S.'s agenda specifically can be or should be in global health moving forward, recognizing that we haven't truly had um, a grand initiative or, um, or commitment in this space um, for a number of years. And I think even before this moment, but particularly in light of this moment that we're in, um, really thinking about what that can be is important for our community. So rest assured that we've been convening partners and members to tackle this question and we'll be revisiting some of those initial proposals um, in the coming weeks um, because we certainly want to get those ideas in front of decision makers now that we fully have their attention. As you can imagine, uh, many of those ideas have talked about how we build on existing platforms um, or our successful programs. They've also touched on how we work across programs or silos um, to be to have more of a systems approach, um, looking at health systems, health workforce and the like, health financing. And then also um, the very real opportunities for integration, not just across health, but um, between health and development and obviously health and environmental issues as we're again, kind of living through today. Um, so that's a preview of what has been shared. We again, have talked about that in Global Health Council meetings and events before, um, but we're hopeful about being able to pull some of those ideas together more concretely um, shortly. Um, with that, I want to thank uh, the, the um, guest speakers who have joined us so far from our membership. I'm grateful to you all for providing your take on how we work in this moment uh, and giving um, a sense of the challenges and opportunities as you see them. Um, I also want to, you know, obviously thank those of you who weighed in with questions and comments. Um, we will we will pivot now to hear from another special guest who hopefully needs no introduction, and yet I will I will try to do that justice. Uh, we are being joined by Dr. Rebecca Martin, who is the head of the Center for Global Health uh, at the CDC. Um, surely she is busy with a number of things um, in this moment, and so um, Dr. Martin, to the degree you hadn't. Haven't heard that already um, on this call. I, I just wanted to extend um, my gratitude on behalf of all of us for the work you and your team are doing, um, not just around this outbreak or pandemic, certainly, um, but around all of the other outbreaks that you all tend to manage to at the start. So um, I, I'm grateful for your time today. I think it would be really great to hear from you, honestly, how you're feeling in this moment. And specifically, um, uh, the ways that you are thinking about your entire global health portfolio um, now that we are in the middle of a pandemic and not just how you're responding to COVID, but really um, how you're thinking um, about global health broadly, um, both short and long term. So with that, I will give you the floor. Thank you, Lois, and it's great to join everyone today. Uh, can you hear me okay, Lois? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, perfect. I uh, just want to thank you, first of all, I really appreciated your poem at the beginning. I think this is so critically important that it really is that only together will we get through this, and we are in very unprecedented. I wanted to also just put a plug in um, also for our the website at CDC, which has a lot of, of information um, about COVID-19, but also guidance that we have been putting out for the domestic um, audience. Um, ranging many different areas. I'll go into a bit more, but just put a plug out for that and we'll send that to for others that would need that. Um, 
just to give you um, a couple of numbers, because I wouldn't be CDC if we didn't share some data with you, but as of March 30th um, in the United States, we do have um, CDC is reporting 140,904 confirmed and presumptive positive cases of COVID-19 and 2,405 uh, COVID-19 related deaths. And as you know, all states um, are reporting as well as the territories. Uh, globally, WHO has reported as of March 30th, uh, 693,244 confirmed cases and a total of 33,160 deaths. The largest activity um, still is occurring in the European region of the WHO. Um, just to start a little bit on the on the domestic side to give a brief update, um, the federal government is really working as one government um, with state, local, tribal, and territorial partners, um, as well as the international and national public and the national um, public health partners that we have. Um, the federal emergency management, uh, FEMA, has been working closely with the Department of Health and Human Services and state, um, local, tribal, and territorial governments for a whole of government response uh, to fight COVID-19 and protect the public in the U.S. In addition, globally, uh, a one U.S. government approach also, as I've heard many of you mention as well, has been the main effort on how we work together across the different um, agencies. Uh, CDC, we've done quite a bit of work and I just wanted to highlight a few things with activating our emergency operations center on January 21st. Um, a few of you are asking um, about the uh, about the the test, and I just wanted to give um, a, just a quick update that we do know that um, Admiral Giroir, um, the Assistant Secretary for Health with HHS, has been leading the effort um, within the um, U.S. government, and so we, while we um, working very carefully to make sure that we can um, stand up the um, the efforts to place, we have improved testing capabilities for citizens. And while we've not been able to provide test kits to international labs, we're working with countries on guidance for best practices as well as quality assurance. Um, and then we've been coordinating with global partners to provide information about additional tests that have been authorized for emergency use by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, enabling international test distribution. Um, countries can also request test kits from other partners, including the World Health Organization, which has been procuring and providing to countries. And then in Africa, the Africa CDC um, has been working closely primarily with Germany in providing test kits as well. So I'll stop there on that, but I think there's a lot of effort moving on that and trying to improve um, access and, and tests. Um, as I mentioned on our website as well, we do have information about the clinical guidance um, and, clini and information for clinical providers in the U.S. and a lot of information and technical assistance be being provided um, through technical and virtual TA, uh, as well as we've got a lot of guidance documents um, working with preparing first, um, first line responders and healthcare providers, reinforcing state and territorial and local public health readiness and then providing the TA and guidance, as I mentioned. On the global uh, level, I think, as you know, I mean, with countries closing borders, uh, flights being canceled, um, there has been as well um, an authorized departure from Department of State for uh, individuals at high risk um, if, if infected with COVID-19. And so there's been um, a lot of discussion about what is um, what we can do and how we are doing it. We still have um, a presence in more than 60 countries where we're working. Um, and we are approaching this, as I mentioned, as a one U.S. government. Um, I think I've heard many of you mention me for Africa and the health systems, the fragile health systems there. And is it physically possible to do physical uh, distancing in some of, if we're thinking about a Kibera in Nairobi or um, Lagos in, in Nigeria, how will this really happen and what can be done when people say that literally people can stay home for maybe a day, um, but not what we're doing here in the US. So what does this have to look like going forward? Uh, we are working here in Atlanta to provide technical resources to our country offices as they pull together um, plans with the US government agencies together and then working with ministries of health and partners. We have also assigned um, liaison officers to uh, the World Health Organization regional offices. Some are virtual and some are actually in person. 
Um, so we are trying to stay very well connected both with the regional offices and WHO headquarters where we also have staff um, right now in place for um, temporary assignments there as well. I think one of the things I wanted to mention uh, in thinking about our um, what are some of the efforts that we're doing? I think the the value and really appreciate the um, 800 million that we have received uh, in the stimulus emergency packages um, that have come through first 300 and then 500 in the in the March 27th two trillion stimulus bill um, and appreciated Jamie's comments on the science. I think this is really critical in thinking about vaccines coming up. Um, rapid diagnostic tests uh, and some of the other work that could be done in thinking about um, treatments. So we're very much looking at this and also thinking about um, how these resources can help us through the period of the response and, and going forward. Um, you've talked a little bit about how global health security um, helped move into making sure that some countries have levels of preparedness and response and our contributions to that uh, we're really looking at building off of what we have done working with countries um, and what we can do going forward, both as U.S. government and then CDC's additional efforts. For example, in India, with the field epidemiology training program, there's been a very much a large surge for rapid response teams um, and training over 209 staff across 27 states, uh, making a master training for COVID-19 that can then be rolled out as a training of trainers um, for the next levels. Uh, in PEPFAR with Vietnam, uh, there's been work to develop guidelines for surveillance and infection prevention and control and lab testing um, that's being supported. And many of you may have heard with polio, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative has put a pause on um, supplemental immunization activities, which is in line with the um, SAGE guidance that came out. Um, and with that, it is offering its management operations and human resources to support COVID-19 in countries. Um, and this has led to a large scale opportunity for contact tracing, case investigation, um, the use of data management, transport systems for laboratories. So there's a lot of efforts and activities going on there. And then building off of the flu um, surveillance platforms for influenza-like illness, uh, really seeing how to strengthen surveillance systems as well. So really seeing how we can build these up. Um, you've talked a little bit about what is the impact on our global health work and how we're seeing our global health work right now. We're, we're ongoing tracking um, what is the cost and what we're not able to do, but we recognize that work that we're doing that is directly saving lives related to PEPFAR and ensuring people have access to antiretrovirals um, this is something being discussed within the Office of Global AIDS Coordinator, um, how we best continue those efforts as well, and what is mission critical for our work to go on. Um, there have been many things that have been suspended or postponed or that will shift. Um, and recognizing that with closing airports and mobility issues, how do you start to continue to provide work, even staff in country, um, if there's a case in an embassy, people are being told to work from home and telework. So again, it's how are we providing support here and partners are really critical at this time. Um, and I've heard Marion mentioned to the communities. I think this is really important about getting uh, community engagement and community ownership of responses here. Um, just a, a note, um, the Ebola effort in, in um, Eastern Congo is still going on. We have a small team there and April 12th will be the day of 42 days since the last um, case was found negative. Um, so we are cautiously awaiting that date, um, but we do have a small team um, on the ground. They're still continuing to support. And I just heard that GOMA reported its first case of COVID-19 today. Um, so that will also now have to, there, the Ebola work has been very much in line that people have been shifted and working on both at the same time. So I think that as we see this, I mean, we in Global Health Security, and I think all of you as well, we've talked about these moments happening and here we are at an unprecedented, unprecedented moment um, but we still have more work to do and it is really the right thing that we have been doing on in preparing getting preparedness getting response uh, activities and ensuring that there can be the detection prevention and response to um, emerging threats and as well as um, large pandemics that are happening now so i mean more of what we're doing
with how health, global health security has supported where we are today, but where it will also need to take us in the future as a, as a globe and, and world health. Uh, so it's important. So I just want to thank, in closing, just thank you again for the valuable partnership, the opportunity to speak with you today, and the opportunities that to have the funds that CDC does to be able to create these essential platforms for outbreak response and disease-specific work um, that has led us to build capacities with countries. Um, time will be the, the test of where we are in the future, but um, definitely appreciate the partnerships. Thank you, Lois, and I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Dr. Martin, for your time and for your remarks. We did have a couple of questions come in as you were speaking, um, and one relates to, I think, this idea of how we, um, I guess, work across programs. Uh, and so there's a question about how, and this is from David Bryden at Results, but how we can help countries maintain programs like those on MDRTB um, when domestic funding shifts um, or when you know staff are sidelined or you have some of the other challenges. And then also um, whether or not there are any opportunities to test um, across COVID and TB, particularly when it comes to um, their uh, parallel symptoms um, and really just thinking about ways we can, um, I guess, combine or incorporate some of the um, contact tracing or, or TB testing um, with what we're doing with COVID-19. No, thank you for that. And I think this is all the programs, uh, by that I mean malaria and TB and HIV and, and immunization are all having to look at their um, current practices, programs, and guidance because a lot of this, I mean, if you're telling people with fever not to come into the clinic for COVID-19 because you don't want spread, but then that also impacts what's happening with malaria. And as we've heard as well with some of the uh, TB complications as well. So I think that this is something that um, different groups and scientists and experts are looking at right now. And we're having those discussions across the efforts um, and recognizing um, there is a risk and benefit balance that has to go on here. For example, I mean, with polio stopping all campaigns means that there will be polio transmission occurring. Uh, while the circulating vaccine derived polio virus outbreaks um, could continue, but knowing that there could be more harm going door to door, um, providing drops um, is really something that we have to to look at in the in the health community and also recognize um, that we've got to put all our efforts in stopping this pandemic. Um, it's it's quite you know very very concerning and 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 as we've heard others say, I mean it will affect and potentially devastate some health systems in in countries. So I think that this is important to see what can be sustained to keep people on treatments um, and also to think about what we can do to stop the, the pandemic. And I think that those solutions will come from a country level um, and with the discussions of the experts of what we would propose on some of those ideas. Thanks for that. Um, another question we received is how um, the CDC is working with um, with Africa CDC and really the priorities for collaboration, whether or not we're providing direct funding. So this is coming from Gerard um, Radabosian. Yeah, so um, we do, and um, State Department as well as working closely, the US um, ambassador to the AU, um, Ambassador Le Pen um, and CDC, we've been working quite closely with Africa Union on the Africa CDC. Uh, we do have two staff as well that are based or embedded within the Africa CDC um, and looking at um, how to support and provide guidance to countries. Um, they have actually been procuring a lot of test kits, as I mentioned, from Germany um, and stationing them in some of their hubs to make sure that they could get um, test kits into countries, especially with borders um, closed, how do you get planes in, charter flights. So I think some of these things are being looked at and we are working very closely. Um, we are having um, weekly calls with Africa CDC on the collaboration and then also bringing in uh, WHO Afro as well. Um, so there is that coordination and connection um, on what guidance is being provided, what data are being um, collected and to ensure that there are similar and coordinated messages on what's happening on the continent. Great, and a couple more questions if you have time. So one is from um, Vince Blazer at Frontline Health Workers Coalition, really asking about the PPE shortages, uh, particularly domestically. And so if there are restrictions on um, how 
that PPE is being procured or if they can be um, brought in from external sources like from China. For, for the U.S., is this question related? Um, I think, yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, um, yeah. Sure I think place, yeah, so. all, all, all avenues are being explored, explored right mm -hmm. now. Um, and then also we're having discussions um, with WHO on what can be supported for other countries too. But for the U.S., there's definitely a lot of um, efforts going on to this in the private and public sector. Okay, thank you. And then there's a question from Daniel Heiberg at Global Water 2020 about what CDC is doing um, with countries to ensure that healthcare facilities have access to water and sanitation, particularly water and soap for hand washing given the pandemic. And this is also, um, I'll just give you one example with through the, the polio work in Afghanistan. Um, all of the um, volunteers that are out in the communities and the frontline workers are also talking about how to do safe and, and effective hand washing um, and also making sure. So I think we're using the, the people that we have and the resources across the different partnerships globally um, to meet to reach the frontline workers to provide this information on the on the access to you know water and and um, sanitation I and think that's a little you know it's hard to build it right now given the situation but I think that there's efforts to make sure that uh, what could be done to to address this on a on a local level um, with tailored practices from the country and ideas and innovations. Okay, great. And sorry, apologies on, on the, you know, just going back to the shortages question, I do think it's relevant domestically, but but specifically when it comes to other countries as well, and given the challenges we're facing in the U.S., I think people are anticipating some of those same challenges being even exacerbated in other countries around the world. And so I think the question is whether or not um, you all have guidance for how they would go about um, addressing some of those procurement challenges or gaps. Yes, and we're, we're in close discussions with USAID on that, but I think as well mm -hmm. with WHO on if, 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 you know, what, if you don't have anything, what can you do? Um, and I think that we're trying to see with WHO, what are some of those um, innovative or different ways of what else could be provided, uh, recognizing that if there are shortages, what else will be done and, and something needs to be done. Uh, so we're having those discussions with WHO and then also with USAID on the procurement side, I know they're heavily engaged in innovative ways of doing that. Thank you. I think that those are the questions that I've received and I recognize that we're a minute before the end. So I just want to thank you again, Dr. Martin, for joining us today. Um, we, we again appreciate not just your time now, but um, all of the work you all are doing at CDC. Um, to stay on top of this. Um, please let us know what we can do or continue to do to try and be helpful to you here in Washington um, or, or beyond. Um, and hopefully we can remain in contact um, as you all um, have updates for the community. Thank you and thanks. To, it was very interesting and, and informative to hear everybody else's updates as well. So really appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. Great, really glad you can join. And if we can um, move to the last slide, I believe, um, we will go ahead and remind people of the resources available on our page uh, on COVID-19. That does include resources from CDC and WHO, um, as well as uh, resources that have been shared across uh, the community. So again, let us know um, what else you would like to see there, what else would be helpful. We have really tried to tailor that so that it's more focused on policy activities or opportunities, knowing that um, that is a real focus for the Global Health Council and that other coalitions or organizations are tracking other issues, um, such as um, um, field operations, um, protocols and whatnot. Um, uh, but with that, uh, stay tuned for our next uh, conversation that we hope to have in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, please be in touch if you have any feedback um, or questions for the team here at GHC. You can just send us an email um, at membership at globalhealth.org. But thank you, everyone, um, for your time today. Stay safe and remember to stay centered uh, in everything that we're enduring. Take care. Thank you.